What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and today we're going to be giving the once over to Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck. Ain't no way to conceal it. There are going to be very few spoilers, if any, in this review, because in all honesty, it's not going to be much of a review. We're going to be talking about all of the ancillary details behind Howard the Duck, including the production and the comics, um, because honestly, those things are more interesting than the movie itself. In 1986, when Howard the Duck came out, it had every possibility of being great. It had nuanced jokes, it had groundbreaking technology, and it had duck boobs. But it ended up being a total flop. Uh, nobody ended up liking it. It did horrible in the box office. And even nowadays, most people only know and like Howard the Duck either because they were a fan of the comic books or because they enjoy the post credit scenes in other Marvel movies. Gross. I'm going to tell you the basic plot of this film, um, but again, I won't really be delving into any spoilers. Basically, Howard is a duck who lives on the planet Duck World, um, and all of a sudden, one day, he is blasted from Duck World all the way to Earth where he ends up in Cleveland. While he's trying to figure out a way home to his home planet, he ends up meeting Beverly, played by Leah Thompson. We're going to start out talking about the opening sequence of this film. Let's take a look at the shot first, and then I'll talk about it a little bit. <laughs> Casey, did you hear something? So the way that this was filmed is that they actually had wires which pulled Howard and the chair all the way backwards. And then later those wires were digitally erased. Um, and this was the first time that this technology was used, which I think is so super cool. You might recognize this sort of technology from movies like Back to the Future 2 and The Matrix. And what a groundbreaking way to kind of start out a movie. This movie was directed by Willard Hike, and it was co-written by him and Gloria Katz, and the executive producer was George Lucas. The three of them had worked together previously on American Graffiti, and when they were talking about how to film the movie, they were kind of throwing around the idea of making Howard animated. But George Lucas actually said, no, let's use my studio, Industrial Light and Magic and create an actual duck suit. They started out by trying to use children actors because obviously Howard the Duck is pretty small. Um, and this did not work out at all. The kids could not handle being in that suit. And they eventually ended up casting Ed Gale. Um, and Ed Gale had a ton of issues in that suit also. He could only see through the duck bill. There were constantly weird explosions that would happen with the suit. Feathers were getting lost. It was super hot in there, so anytime that they would take a break, they used to put like an air conditioner, like a hair dryer, inside the duck bill. Gail also has recalled that he used to actually have to walk backwards because he couldn't see out of the suit at all. So anytime that they were doing rehearsals, he would walk backwards before doing the final take of walking forward. However, something good did come out of it. Ed Gale also says that the only reason that he ended up getting cast in Spaceballs is because Mel Brooks said, anybody who is in Howard the Duck can be in my movie. They did all the filming of this movie before they actually even cast the voice of Howard the Duck, which is insane to me because at some point you have to synchronize those two things. And I will tell you this much, just from making these YouTube videos, I know that synchronizing is challenging enough, so I can't even imagine trying to get a duck bill to match somebody's voice. When they were attempting to cast the voice of Howard the Duck, they actually auditioned a whole bunch of people like John Cusack, Martin Short, and also Robin Williams. And Robin Williams actually worked for a week on the project. However, he ended up quitting and walking out after one week because he felt confined by a duck's flapping bill. Eventually, Chip Zian was cast in the part and he became Howard's voice. Let's talk a little bit more about production and the gigantic disaster that this movie was. So sequences like this one right here ended up taking months and months to film. And for some reason, it's just completely hilarious to me that it would take months and months to film a duck's feathers becoming erect. Moving right along. Dig -a -den, dig -a -den, dig -a -den. Can you guys tell that I'm having fun with this one? I learned so much about comic books. 
I was very excited to review this movie, but I wanted to make sure that I knew something about the comics. So I bought these two lovely little guys right here. These are issues 12 and 13 from the original 1977 comics, which um, are by Steve Gerber, and they are Marvel Comics. Now, when I got these issues, I knew that they were key issues of the comic books, um, and I knew that the reason that that was is because it's actually the first time that the band Kiss was ever in a comic book, which is super cool because I love Kiss. And then, after I read through the comics, I realized that Howard is sedated through almost the entirety of issues 12 and 13, which means that I didn't get to see anything about his character. Instead, he pretty much just says, huh, 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 huh the entire time. So my idea of being able to compare the comics to the movie um, by myself was thrown out the window. But luckily I have a whole bunch of really wonderful friends who were able to help me out. So I want to say an extra special thank you to Keith, Dave, and Eric. I would not have been able to do this portion of the review without you guys. Thank you so much. So the first thing that everybody says is that in the comics he's a cynical kind of asshole. Um, he's like very grumpy. He's a curmudgeon. He's not a great guy in all of the ways. There are certainly lots of ways that he is, but he's just kind of a jerk. Um, and in the movie, he's quite the opposite of that. He is like the good guy through and through. And one of my friends actually made a really good point. He said that it was kind of Disney-fied, um, which makes sense because it's a George Lucas film. Um, so maybe George Lucas was kind of building off of that kid-friendly energy from Star Wars and really wanted to make sure that Howard the Duck was accessible because it would look appealing to children. Something that made Howard really stand out from other comics, especially at the time, was that he really he never wanted to be a hero. Um, he wasn't searching for the limelight and he pretty much was just doing the right thing when nobody else would do it. He hated to be in danger, but he couldn't turn his back on something that was wrong. And this is definitely a similarity that we see between the comic book and the movie. The movie definitely delves into that aspect of Howard as a character. In doing my research for this review, in addition to watching the movie and reading the comics, at least two issues of it, um, I decided that I really wanted to know a little bit more about the history of Marvel because it's not really something that I know a lot about. I'll be the first to admit that I'm not a huge comic book fan. I haven't bought comic books since Bartman came out, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, and I just don't know a lot myself. So I was trying to figure out if Howard the Duck was really the first Marvel movie that ever came out, um, because that's kind of interesting. That's like groundbreaking and historical. And what I discovered is that a Captain America movie came out in 1944, and the other sort of Marvel film that came out before Howard the Duck was Red Sonja, um, which came out in 1985, so the year before Howard the Duck came out. And that was a character that Marvel technically owned the rights to, so you could consider that a Marvel film. Um, something interesting about that is that Marvel didn't actually own the rights to Conan, so that's why those aren't considered Marvel films. But basically, Howard the Duck in 1986 was the first time that there was like a full-on adaptation of a Marvel comic into film. And because of this, it was the first time that a Marvel comic stood to make Hollywood money. So in 1980, six years before Howard the Duck was actually released, um, Gerber actually sued Marvel for copyright, and he claimed that he was the sole owner of the character Howard the Duck. This lawsuit ended in 1982, with Gerber admitting that he did work for hire for Marvel, and as such, Marvel was the owner of Howard the Duck. So basically, Gerber, the original creator of this character, got nothing. And as far as I can tell, this is the first of many comic book related lawsuits because so many creators ended up losing their intellectual property because they were working for these giants, Marvel and DC. Steve Gerber was so frustrated by this entire situation that he ended up creating another comic in 1982 called Destroyer Duck in order to try to raise more funds for lawsuits. Because basically, up until this point, it wouldn't have been really worth it for any of these creators to sue the comic book companies because there wasn't a ton of money. But now that that possible Hollywood money was coming into the picture, Steve really wanted to maintain control of his creative energy. Destroyer Duck was originally released on Ellipse Comics, and now it looks like it's actually owned by Image Comics. Image decided that they were going to be a publishing company where they allowed the artists and the creators of the comics to maintain the copyright 
copyrights of those works. So this really allowed creators to have much more control over the things that they were creating. And I think it's so interesting that basically Howard the Duck was one of the first things that ever brought this to the attention of the masses because it was the first time that one of these lawsuits actually drew focus. And that was 10 years before Image Comics actually came out. Whew, okay, that was a little bit of a tangent relating to Howard. Let's move on to Beverly, played by Leah Thompson. First of all, can we just talk about how stunningly gorgeous Leah Thompson is? How did I not remember how friggin' gorgeous she is? She seems to have quite the fondness for Howard the Duck. In fact, I'm pretty sure that her career is pretty much entirely centered around Howard the Duck. Um, yes, I know that she did four seasons of Caroline in the City, but who talks about that anymore? In 2018, she said that she would absolutely love to direct a reboot of Howard the Duck. Um, she just seems to really love it and want to be involved in it. I know she's also directed a few episodes of The Goldbergs, and I know that The Goldbergs references Howard the Duck a lot, so I'm sure that those two things are related. But other than that, she hasn't done too much. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Tell me if I'm wrong. What I can definitely say is that she did a great job in the role of Beverly. Um, she's sweet, she's funny, she's cute, she's very exposed. Next up, we'll talk about Jeffrey Jones as Dr. Walter Jennings. He becomes possessed and starts referring to himself as the Dark Overlord of the Universe, which I kind of want that title now. And I'm pretty sure that Vincent D'Onofrio's appearance and character design in Men in Black um, was just entirely based on Jeffrey Jones and Howard the Duck. In fact, there's an awful lot of similar looking aliens in the two. And is this just basically a xenomorph tongue? Tim Robbins plays scientist Phil, who is trying to help Howard return home. And let me tell you, he delivers some of the worst lines in the entire movie, which is really honestly hard to believe because there's an awful lot of bad one-liners in this one. If you can't take the heat, get out of that kitchen. Get out of there, duck! And proud of it. You're in big trouble now. Yeah, shut up. One of the reasons that the character of Phil annoys me so much is because his entire point in the movie is to, like, explain the obvious jokes. Um, so, for example, there's a point where Howard is hilariously trying to fly an airplane and he can't fly, and that's funny because obviously ducks are supposed to fly. And we can see that that's funny. We don't need that joke to be handed to us on a silver platter. But, of course, Phil has to go, Fly, yeah. Howard! Use your duck instincts. I am aware that that is the joke. Like, we don't need to have that joke be said to us out loud. And then literally minutes later, the plane crashes, Howard can't swim, he's floundering around in the water, and Phil goes, Never heard of a duck that couldn't swim! Yes, that's literally the joke that we are seeing. You don't need to explain every little thing to me. Okay, let's talk about the numbers. So Howard the Duck, like I said, was a complete flop. It was a total failure. Um, in fact, it cost $37 million to make, and it only ended up grossing $16 million in the U.S. At the time, the average cost of making a movie was $14.5 million. So that really gives you an idea of how exorbitant this film was. I'm going to compare that to my least favorite movie of all time, Waterworld which you probably already know by now. The reason that I think that this is an interesting comparison is because both movies had really huge budgets and ended up being flops. Waterworld had a $235 million budget and ended up only taking in $88 million gross in the U.S. And at the time that it came out, which was 10 years later than Howard the Duck in 1996, the average cost of making a movie was $50.4 million. So if we just look at the numbers, it kind of looks like Howard the Duck is better than Waterworld's, but I can tell you with certainty that Waterworld is absolutely worse. And the reason that I can say that is because if we look at the number of awards that each movie got, Howard the Duck wins out. Howard the Duck got four Razzies and Waterworld only got one. Yes, I know that Razzies are bad. We're going to end this review with a couple more little bits and bobs about the movie. And we'll start out with talking about the theme song, the music, and all these erotic butt shots. So the theme song for Howard the Duck is maybe the goofiest theme song of all time. It's so 80s. It's so crazy. I'm going to be honest with you, up until filming this, I've been dancing around my entire house singing to it, so maybe I actually like it, but it's pretty bad. It's pretty awful. And what I learned while I was researching is that it's actually co-written by George Clinton. Whew, how the mighty have fallen. 
Next up, I'm just going to tell you a couple little fun facts about Howard the Duck, the comics. So in the comics, Doctor Strange actually offered to teach Howard the mystic arts, and Howard said no. Um, I'm going to go ahead and guess that this is because he doesn't have any superpowers and he doesn't want any, uh, but I think that's kind of interesting. Howard also became the living embodiment of the Nexus of Realities, and he was nominated for president. He probably would have made a good one, let's be honest. Claude Stark actually made him an iron duck armor, which as my friend put it, really looked more like a modified fire hydrant. And he became a US citizen, um, which is interesting since of course he is from the planet Duck Worlds. Um, but he was forced to join the 50 States Initiative, which was a result of the Superhuman Registration Act. I think that's particularly interesting because obviously Howard doesn't have any superhero powers. In fact, during that whole thing, She-Hulk was actually his attorney. And the rumor is right now that in the upcoming She-Hulk series, Howard will be there. So something for us all to look forward to. And lastly, I just want to talk about the fact that everybody thinks that Howard is actually a child in a costume. There are several times in the movie where people mistake him for a child in a costume and they make comments like, wow, what an amazing costume, blah, blah, blah. And two times in particular, when he's being mistaken for a child, he then immediately gets treated like an adult. So for example, we have this scene where the bouncer believes that Howard is actually a child. He says to him, don't fool me, no kids allowed. And then his response to get him out of the nightclub, is to throw him out. Why would you throw a child? And similarly, at one point, Howard, Beverly, and the Dark Lord of the Universe all go out to a diner, and Beverly ends up ordering Special three beers, beers, obviously one for each of them. Now the waitress had just thought that he was a child, but then when Beverly orders three beers, no big deal, let's give Howard a beer. Why would you serve a child a beer? Overall, this movie is sporadic, it has bad one-liners, the plot is shaky at best, um, I don't really feel like it stays true to the comic books, and I know I haven't read all of the comic books, but that's just kind of the impression that I'm getting from what I have read. And, um, yeah, it wasn't that great. It was definitely a flop. I think it would have been a lot better if Howard had been animated, and I look forward to seeing what's going to happen with his character. But I will say that I absolutely love watching this movie. Every time that I watch it, even though I'm not a huge fan of it, I end up having a blast. And I'm having a blast talking about it. I've really enjoyed researching this one. I, it's probably the most fun that I've had while creating a review. So perhaps I like it a little bit more than I think I do. And because of that, I'm going to give this movie three out of seven thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching. It really means a lot to me. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And I can't wait.